Well, this is the $64,000 question, what to do with these people. You simply cannot decide when they are on the boats crossing the sea, risking to drown, to see whether they are economic migrants or real refugees. So you have to abide by international laws. We normally um, do what international law dictates. You take them on, and then you process the, the individuals. Now, I know that there is this big debate going on, uh, what is meant by economic migrants, and what is meant by, by real refugees. It's not easy, not some, not easy to, 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 to answer, and it's not easy to, to decide. It takes time. But as I was saying in the, in the, in the, in the lecture, I mean, by the, time, by the time you get these people settled, I mean, to look after their immediate needs, um, uh, and start examining them, it takes time. Now, this is a question which does not bear only on Malta. It bears on the whole European Union, and this is why I was complaining about lack of solidarity and lack of cooperation, because the issue is so big, it cannot be handled by one single country, whether it's Greece or, or Malta or Italy or whatever. I mean, this has to be, it has to be a, um, a common problem, a problem for Europe, which with its own um, level of development is attracting these young people to come out of Africa to come to Europe, but there has to be a policy which is equitable, first of all, which respects these individuals for, for the human beings that they are, because they are not numbers, they are human beings, and at the same time also then to abide by international laws, because one can also understand that simply a country simply cannot open its doors and allow anybody to come in, because obviously there would be anarchy. So the, in the future, what one thinks would be the best option is, as we're talking, trying to cooperate with Africa as much as possible, trying to help with its development, trying to help with its uh, investment in Africa, education in Africa, both youth and women at the same time, and also trying to, to, to help with um, programs that would give a chance for young people from Africa to come to Europe to, to, to learn, to educate themselves, to earn some money, to, to, to go back to their countries and um, plow that into the economy. This is, there's no single answer to that. There's no simple answer to that. It's very complicated. And I honestly hope that uh, this um, policy on Africa, which is going to be launched by the European Union in the coming, in the coming months, will in itself start um, dealing with, with the issues one by one so that eventually uh, we will see that this is something which has to take 20, 25 years at least. That will start showing some, some results. Well, being an island state, the small state hasn't kept us from taking initiatives in the past. Obviously, not, not military initiatives or, or initiatives involving economic might or an economic uh, weight, but we have never been, we've never kept back from taking political decisions and even from, be, from being um, standard bearers for certain issues. For example, if I take you back years to the United Nations, we were the ones that launched uh, the law of the sea which today controls um, practically um, all maritime borders, all drilling and, and shipping and what have you. So being a small country should not deter us from taking initiatives. We have also been upfront in, in organizing conferences between the European Union and Africa. We have been, we have been also um, organizing chogams, meetings of the, of, the, of, the, of the Commonwealth countries. So I don't, see, I don't see the problem. Obviously, we don't have the weight that big countries have around the table when we come to certain decisions. But then we are clever enough not to pretend that we dictate to these countries that have um, military might and that have uh, big economic power what they should do. So we, we know where our, where our um, capabilities take us and we try to, to do whatever we can um, in the best of our abilities in that particular sector. I'm sure that there is no country which can claim not to have corruption. So uh, I'm not claiming that we don't have corruption or never had corruption. The issue is that once corruption is detected, the important thing is that you have the, 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 um, the institutions, 
that do take care of that. And there is the, the rule of law, there are police institutions, courts of justice which are respected and which are free to, to, to do what they have to do. So, um, as I said, I mean, without saying that there is no corruption, that we are a perfect state, it's not, it's not true. And at the same time, we also work very closely with um, international European organizations like the Council of Europe, um, especially the, um, uh, the Venice Commission and even Greco, um, which are authorities in guiding countries as to what they have to do to see that their institutions function. So uh, these have to be kept under watch constantly, uh, which means that even Parliament will have to be on the, on the, on the lookout for um, whatever happens. And in a democratic society with a free, with a free media, you have these things being you know, flagged up uh, before any politician um, knows about them because you find them in the papers, you find them on the media. So the moment, the moment they appear, you have to majorly take action. And this is what, what happens, this is what we're doing in Malta. Well, this ties up with the, all the other questions doing with migration. Um, again, um, how are we going to get to know who are those migrants who are leaving because of war, who are leaving because of conflict, or leaving because there is, there is a crop failure, or shortage of water, or rising temperatures? I mean, anything which would be untowered to the quality of life of, of, of an individual would make him move. Um, many people react that way, in the sense that if something is not functioning properly, they try to move to a better, better place. Now, by the time they, they move from, let's say, Central Africa or um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or Sahel, and they go through Libya and they come, I mean, they become part of a crowd with people leaving for different, different objectives. And then again, this takes us back to the what I was talking about, the fact that you have to sort these people, first of all, obviously, to give them the first attention and the most important attention that they would um, uh, qualify for. I mean, give them, you know, refuge, uh, try to rescue them from, from drowning in the sea, um, look after their immediate attention, their immediate needs, and then obviously start deciding who is eligible and who is not eligible. I think that even though we have uh, a lot of sympathy for people who are looking for a better quality of life. But then we also have to keep in mind that there are international regulations that keep pe people from moving in such huge quantities that could make a, a lot of difference in different countries. Now, speaking about Malta, we have a country of only 330 square kilometers with a population of half a million, which means that we are the most intensely populated island in Europe. Now, there is what I call the carrying capacity. There is an absorptive capacity. You cannot simply say, imagine uh, 2,000 refugees arriving in Malta in one day. Okay. Immediately, you can cope with them, you can give them food, you can give them drink, you can give them shelter. But what do you do with them? And this takes us to the issue of solidarity, which one expects to have once we are members of the European Union, of this, this group of nations, that speaks so much of solidarity. I mean, we've shown so much solidarity when there was the, the banking crisis and everybody was pumping millions into, into the banks to try to save the economy. I mean, but when you come to, to, to distributing um, uh, these, I wouldn't call them refugees as yet because they would not be qualified as refugees, they're just immigrants. But when it comes to, to talking about how we're going to do with this influx, there is no agreement, unfortunately. And this is a big problem. In, in our population now, we've come to a point where about 25% of the population by, by the next five years would be over 65 because of increased longevity, because of good health practices. Um, so it is, it is, I would say, a problem. It's an issue. In Malta, there are no restrictions whatsoever on what old people can do. Obviously, there is the retirement age when one comes to, to, to stop working. But there are lots of possibilities for, for old people to keep on an active life. There's definitely no, no, there are no laws against um, ageism or, or discrimination against age. But obviously, they bring along problems in the sense that there is, uh, even though they are still alive, 
there are there is morbidity they are they are more prone to to diseases they are obviously um, taking much more time in the health from the health system but at the same time i mean they are enjoying life as long as they are i mean we even provide um, courses at university for for what we call the fourth the fourth age and the third age so there are no no problems with 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 people who are you know beyond 65 in Malta to keep on um, conducting an active life in in Malta I would I would say that many of them move on those that are public spirited move on to to, to voluntary organizations and uh, also keep on doing what what they enjoyed doing when they were still young um, uh, no I don't think it's a problem the only thing is that we have to think in terms of of demographics and as I said um, the fact that we have all these foreign workers coming to Malta to boost the economy um, for us puts us puts our mind at rest that there is somebody contributing to social services so that these elderly people will keep receiving their own their pensions because mm. you know s some time ago there was this fear that there wouldn't be enough people paying I mean there's a, a watershed in the sense that you have to have a certain amount of people in active work to contribute um, to our social services to see that the elderly people continue receiving their pensions. At one time, we were on the brink of saying, oh, this, could be, this could be a problem. But the, the moment we, the economy started um, going um, really strong, and we, 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 today, today we import about 60,000 foreign workers out of a population, working population of 240,000 which means that there is enough contribution going into the into the the, um, the funds of the state so there is no problem with with uh, the elderly people carrying on with their with their pensions obviously they always grumble that it's not enough as they do in all other countries and recently there have been quite a lot of um, uh, increments given to elderly people so that their quality of life would be okay and then there are also lots of benefits which they can which they can make use of for example, they can have um, free transport um, all over the island without paying anything. So there are, apart from the fact that they keep on obviously enjoying free health care, you know, from, from uh, till they die. You don't pay anything, absolutely. And many of them also get most of their medicines for free from, from, the, from the government. So it's, I, I don't think, they, they have, obviously, they always grumble because everybody wants to, to make his life better. But on the whole, compared to the situation in other countries, I think it's quite, quite, quite comfortable. Well, as we said from the very beginning, um, we would have liked it not to have happened. Because uh, the United Kingdom was a very important uh, member of the, United, of, the, of the European Union, contributed in its um, uh, stay in the European Union contributed heavily towards the uh, economic, political and security development of the European Union. But once the British people decided to leave, respect that decision and, uh, and, and try to um, work around it um, on two counts. One of them, as a member of the European Union, will be on the other side um, uh, discussing with the United Kingdom the terms of the new relationship. Obviously there is the withdrawal agreement which the British Parliament accepted. Now, the issue is building the new agreement. And uh, from what we're hearing, obviously, the United Kingdom is very keen on having a free trade um, uh, agreement with the European Union. And we augured that they have the best of, of, of conditions, which would be to the satisfaction of both sides. Obviously, uh, the United Kingdom is not many people compared to, the, to the, what's happening with Canada, what's happening with Japan, with I mean, these are different entities. The United Kingdom itself is such an important entity. It's such a big um, market for the European Union that I'm sure that in the negotiations, um, this will be taken into consideration. And hopefully, both sides will be happy with the outcome. As far as Malta is concerned, um, as I said, this will be on this side. But when we're talking about our relations with the United Kingdom outside the European Union eventually, I made, I made reference to that in my, in my presentation. Um, we, we are concerned, first of all, um, about our relations. We would like to see that trade between Malta and the, European, and the United Kingdom remains what it is. At the moment, it is, I would say, the major 
um, besides Italy, it's one of the major major exporters and importers. Um, we we trade something like 1.5 billion um, euros between between the two countries, and we receive something like half a million tourists from the United Kingdom to Malta, out of two and a half million. Two and a half million is the total number of uh, tourists that come to Malta. Um, half a million of them come from the United Kingdom. Apart from that, I mean, they also tourism also leaves a lot of money in, in the economy, something like 1.5 billion, billion euros. So that is something we wouldn't like to see changing to start with. Secondly, the special relationship that we had before either of us were members of the European Union, that is something we would like to, to keep. Not forget, we were a colony of the, of the uh, British Empire at the time, um, uh, and there were certain relationships, especially in education, in medicine, and as far as residents are concerned. So those are three, three sectors in which, and I'm sure that by now, um, the government is already having fruitful discussions and deep discussions about um, what the future relationship is going to be. I started that when I was still foreign minister, um, but now I know that they've been talking about it and even um, the High Commissioner in Malta is explaining both to British residents what the situation is going to be like, you know, what, what, what forms they have to fill, what, what regulations they have to abide by, and the same thing is being done by, by Malta. So one of them is to see that the residents that have now become part and parcel of society, either here in the United Kingdom or in Malta by the British, um, will, will have a smooth transition without, without, without any, any, any problems. The other one is education. This is a little bit more difficult because we have to see in the future what conditions will be applied to Maltese um, students coming to the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom now will become a, a, third, a third country. It will not be any more member of the European Union. So one will have to see what the relations will be and what the, what the charges are going to be. Because at the moment, um, multi students come over and have the same conditions as UK residents when they go to universities and they do um, postgraduate studies. And the other one is about health. Health means that, um, as I had occasion to say, we have a very good health system, which practically covers anything, brain surgery, heart surgery, you name it. But there are certain conditions which are, which are, which are uh, difficult or, or rare, and we don't have the expertise for that. So we send them to centers that are, that are uh, you know, that get a lot of these cases because they are covering a catchment area, which is practically the whole of the Commonwealth. So you get, you get them all being sent to one specialized center in the United Kingdom. And that is something which we make use of with different cases and, and, and rare cases that we have. Up to now, this has worked, and let's hope that it will, it will, the, the, the arrangement will keep um, uh, being applied even after the, 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 the exit of the United Kingdom from, from the European Union.